Yo creo que sin más vamos a dar ya paso al siguiente ponente. Él es Andrew Marsevsky, es responsable web e intranet de Capgemini en Reino Unido. Es considerado uno de los mayores expertos en gamificación y es creador de los tipos de jugadores, una metodología que nos permite dirigir, encontrar las mejores dinámicas de juego para eh, cada proyecto según pensando en los tipos de jugadores. Así que él mismo nos lo va a explicar ahora mismo. Un fuerte aplauso para Andrew. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm hoping that was a good intro. I have no idea. Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about player types and user types. So my very first question to you all, I can see out that way, yep. Um, who in here has heard of Bartle's player types? Yep. Uh, if you just about see it, who's heard of Amy Jo Kim's social player types? Less people, okay. Playnomics? Not a, oh, one hand, excellent. And Nicole Lazaro's Four Keys to Fun. So all of these are kind of taxonomies, they're concepts, they're ideas, they're ways of categorizing people to enable you to create better experiences for players. Now, I'm stressing the word players because when you look at players, you're looking at people who are voluntarily playing a game. They have entered the system, the magic circle, because they wanted to. These are all meant for games. They're meant for World of Warcraft, Farmville. And they're designed based on observation of those environments. Bartle based his on his mud environment. So he did a lot of research, did a lot of talking to people, and came up with his types. Uh, four keys to fun. You know, they're, not, they're not a categorization, they're still a tool. But again, lots and lots of research on games, on people who look like this. I want to play what he's playing. I have no idea what it is, but I want to play it. But it's for people who day to day when they're playing their games, these are the kind of reactions they're getting. We've already seen this lovely lady up here. I think he's fantastic. Whatever he's playing looks fabulous. She looks terrified and, or horrified, something, I don't know. But the reactions you're getting from these people are incredible. Now, the problem we have is that's not the real world. That's a lovely virtual world that somebody created for them to feel safe in and play in. I'll have to point at that thing over there, don't I? See, this is the real world. This is what we actually play with on a day-to-day -day basis. Spreadsheets, vending machines, Twitter, uh, Amazon. You can see my, uh, the sort of things I read there, Batman and sci-fi. So these are all things that, that we would deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, and these are the things we're looking at in gamification. We're looking at these people. Now, on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm there. I'm a developer by day, so I work with websites, I work with code, so I tend to be shouting at my screen. It's always the computer's fault, it's never my fault, it's never the coder's fault. Or it's the client's fault, that's the other, that's the other option. So I created this. Now, there's some science behind it, there's some observation behind it, there's a bit of intuition behind it, And the idea is, it's a tool that I think can help people when they're designing gamified systems. And the reason I think it can help people is because it's designed for gamification. It was designed, rather than observation of behavior, it was designed on the actual motivations that we've heard talked about before. So I looked at something that I, I coined as the RAMP framework. Relatedness, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Now, hands up if you've heard any of those said today so far. Yeah, there was a fantastic talk on education that talked about um, Raya, uh, Desi and um, self-determination theory. So, of course, most of that comes from self-determination theory. Some of it comes from Dan Pink's drive. And I thought these give a really nice kind of simple way of looking at what motivates people. You have lots of frameworks out there. Some are complex, some are simple. Again, they're all just tools in an armory as a gamifier. So what have we got? I'm going to start over here. Philanthropist. Now, this is the person who is motivated by purpose. 
Now, in this case, I'm not talking about purpose as in the princess saving the prince. I'm talking about um, meaning within someone's life. So it's... Um, if I am working in an office, as I do, I sit and I work on the intranet, um, my meaning for my world is that whilst I'm this tiny little cog in a massive 10,000 people machine, without me, the intranet stops working. So without the intranet, people don't get all the legal documents they need or the information they need. Without that, they can't go to clients. Without going to clients, they can't win business. So my purpose is making sure that this tiny little cog keeps the whole machine running. And all of us are tiny little cogs. We all have our bit to play within whatever environment we're in. So that's kind of purpose. Now, when you look at the philanthropist idea, um, when we look at gamified system, purpose can be um, answering questions. It can be when you look at Cora, that's populated by philanthropists. Their purpose is to help other people. So that's what altruism, another word we can use there. I'm going to come back to Disruptor. Free spirits. Free spirits autonomy. Um, Anne mentioned it earlier very kindly. Um, now, the free spirit is the person who is a bit creative. They're the one in the office who wears the red shoes. Uh, they're the one in the office who has the, the plaid jacket when everyone else is wearing their suit jacket and their tweeds. They're creative. They explore. Within your system, they're the ones who will look for the boundaries. They'll look for the Easter eggs. They'll look for the things that other people didn't look for because that's what they enjoy. Um, they're the ones who, on a virtual world, will go right to the edge and see what happens. Do you fall off? Do you stay where you are? Achiever. The achiever is the one who's looking for mastery. They want to learn something. They want to feel they've achieved something, they've advanced in some way, they've leveled up. Um, so in an education system, majority of the people in there, you know, in a learning system, are probably somewhere around there, otherwise they've clicked on the wrong link. Socializer, self-explanatory. Everyone in here has probably got a bit of socializer in them because they're sat next to people. If they couldn't deal with other people, they wouldn't be sat in here, they'll be sat at home. Um, but they're looking for relatedness. They're looking for relationships, um, be it digital, be it online with, um, with uh, LinkedIn or with Facebook, or just down the pub. You know, they, they don't, they, it's, it's, it's just about people. Player, that's who we all build for. Just about every gamified system that exists at the moment concentrates very heavily around here, especially at the onboarding phase. Uh, they're the ones who want points, badges, leaderboards, presents, prizes, collectibles. They're the ones that come into a system very early and leave very early. And finally, the disruptor. Now, this is a group that um, have a sort of positive and a negative effect on systems. Um, on the plus side, a disruptor will find problems with a system. Um, like an explorer, they'll find the boundaries, and then they'll break them. And then they'll try and break your system. If they are of a more positive nature, they'll come back to you and say, you can improve your system because I found this problem with it. If they're on the negative side of things, uh, they'll just break it, and they'll do it for fun. And actually, when you're building a gamified system, you have to be incredibly careful because... We heard someone say, it might have been yesterday actually, that there are certain age groups that don't react well to gamification initially. They're kind of the first ones that go, ah, oh, that's a silly word, I don't like that. And they can often be the biggest problem when you roll a system out because they're the ones who will actively look to prove you're wrong. Some will just passively sit there and moan on Twitter or they'll moan on the internal network. Others will actually try and break it and prove that your system was rubbish and was wrong. So you have to be a little bit cautious about how you deal with them. But they're looking for change generally. You can support these guys in different ways. Um, now, yesterday I did a workshop on how to, um, how to build for, for user types. And the basic idea was that each of these user types can be motivated in different ways. They're looking for different things in a system. You can build a system that tries to encompass all of them, or you can build a system that's just focusing on particular groups that you think will benefit you. Um, but there are different ways to support them. And these are a few, and I mean a few ways. This is, um, you, know, you look at lists of mechanics and elements and these sort of things, there are thousands. So I've picked, uh, I think, six for each one just to, to keep us going. So players, nice and easy. They're looking for points, rewards, leaderboards, badges, economies, lotteries. Be careful with virtual economies. My tip there, the legalities behind those are incredibly hard to, to navigate. 
Um, philanthropists, as I said, they're looking for meaning. They're looking to caretake people. They're looking to help people. Um, I say collect and trade. There, there are certain things that they might want to have that enable them to help other people. Um, someone was talking to me earlier about leaderboards and how does a leaderboard help people like philanthropists. Well, actually, a leaderboard um, done well can introduce you to people you don't know. So I'm on Stack Exchange, and I'm really good at JavaScript. I'm not, but I'm saying I am. And I want people to find me because I want to help them. My buzz in life is helping people with JavaScript. I have nothing else in my life. My children mean nothing. Um, so I want people to know I'm the best so I can help them. The leaderboard helps that. The badges that say JavaScript King or Ninja or whatever it's going to be say that I know about JavaScript. So when people look on that forum, they'll go, oh, he's good at JavaScript. I'm going to talk to him, and I get to help them. I get my buzz. Free spirits. Now, if you're looking at games, someone mentioned it earlier, you're looking at autonomy. Minecraft is just the, the epitome of what, it, what, it, what gets a free spirit going. They can explore, they can create, they can do all kinds of great stuff. Within a gamified system, you know, when you're looking at pure gamification, you're looking more at Easter eggs, um, things they can find that other people might not have noticed. Um, you're looking for them to be able to explore, to unlock new content, um, and to create things. Um, so it might just be that you get them to create new content for you. You're looking for new logos. They're the guys to talk to if you don't want to go to an external company initially. Achiever, again, they're looking for progression. They're looking for feedback to show that they're getting somewhere. So you give them challenges. You give them certificates. You know, we, I think almost everyone in here has done Kevin's course, yeah? Put your hands up if you've done Kevin's course. Put your hands up if you've done Victor's course on diversity. Yeah, a few hands. At the end of it, you get a certificate. Now, the certificate might not have been the reason you went there, but it's a really nice recognition of your achievement. It reminds you personally you achieved something, and actually it can show other people that you achieved something. So that's kind of what you're looking for with that. You're looking for new skills. You're looking for quests. I say boss battles here. Now, I quite like gaming terminology. I try not to use it in a professional sense, but I quite enjoy it. And boss battles makes um, management think I'm about to start a fight with them, which I might do, but today not so much. But it's just kind of that, that challenge that just shows you've learned everything, that you've, you've mastered something and can move on to the next phase. Relatedness, again, fairly simple concept. Give people the ability to connect to other people. Simple. Internal social networks, um, competitions a little bit, collaboration far more importantly. And disruptor. You either get rid of them or you give them something to do. So you give them an innovation platform. They're looking for change. Give them a way to actually say, look, I can change your system. And give them a way that they actually like. Allow them to have a voice. Allow them to vote. Allow them to develop the fixes for the problems they think they found. You know, almost looking towards the free spirit there. Because let them actually build the solution to the problem they think they have. Because they think they're doing you a favor. They think that what they're doing is going to help you in the long run. So let them try. And at the bottom there, I put anarchy. Now, that's a really hard one to sell to a boss or a client. Yes, just let them do whatever they want. But actually, give them an hour to do whatever they want, and they will find more bugs on your system than all the debuggers you can hire. Because they'll just go wild and try and trash it. And if you let them do that, and you give them the freedom to do that, then they'll go and do it. If you don't give them the freedom to do that, they'll go and do it anyway, but you won't know they're trying. At least you have some vague control. I have some figures. Now, I've got a minute and a half, so I'm going to kind of rush through this a bit. I have a survey out which collects some information about what people think their user types are based on how they answer these questions. And, and these are the results from 800 people. There's 1,000 now, I think. 46% of people showed in their user type that they had an achiever quality. It wasn't the only user type they came up with but they'll be either an achiever socializer or an achiever player, whatever. They, they, they had this kind of thing in them. 8% um, player, very, very small percentage of players. So when you're looking at points and badges, you're looking at a very small group of people who are going to be initially engaged. Socializers, quite a nice percentage. Um, philanthropists, not so much. People don't like helping other people, it turns out. 
Um, disruptors, again, not so much, but you wouldn't expect everyone to want to destroy everything. And free spirits, a reasonable number. So, I mean, this achieve a bit is huge. But it's not, because in reality, what I've got there is the result of what people like to fill in surveys. And it turns out, funnily enough, when they come from adversity or from a social media request, you've got lots of socializers and lots of achievers. Well, they're doing a university course, you'd hope they're achievers. And they've come from Twitter. Again, hope they're socializers. And the reason I'm saying that is because this is a tool, and that's all it is. It's got some science behind it. I'm about to get flashed. Um, but the majority of it's all about a tool to help you realize that all of these people are different. And they're going to change as they play the game. As they go through your system, they'll go in as one type, they'll come out as another. So what you have to do, whether you use my tool, whether you use someone else's tool, you have to plan for different people to succeed in your gamified system. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Tenemos una pregunta por ahí rapidísima y varias por aquí, así que allí mira, levanta. Oh, good. I didn't get questions last year. <laughs> Hello, this. Hello. Uh, sorry, because my English is not very good. I'm going to do the my question in Spanish. Can someone translate for me? Then? <laughs> eh, sí, pero tendrías que a quien. Ah, vale. Necesitamos a alguien que se lo ponga. Or perhaps you can translate, Maria. Oh, you, you I I've got, I've got a translator. Easy. Here we go. Oh, <laughs> okay. Eh, me gustaría. Eh, has, has dicho oh, hang que los. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay. Technical difficulties here. I have no coordination. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't apologize to me. Okay. <laughs> let's try that again. Yes. Okay. Yep, thank you very four. much. I'm so sorry. Four. Number four. Eh, <laughs> me gustaría saber. Eh, has dicho que los players. Eh, abandonan muy rápido, ¿es así? Eh, que tienen, eh, abandonan más rápido que el resto de las categorías. ¿Tienes analizado, porque esta mañana alguien ha preguntado algo parecido, cómo, cómo fidelizar al que, tiene, al que tiene tantas ganas de probar cosas nuevas y a lo mejor fidelizarle para que se mantenga en, nuestro, en nuestra propuesta de gamificación? Si tenéis estudiado cómo, cómo retenerle, porque esto va por modas, de repente se pone de moda el Candy Crush y abandona la palabra dos, o sea, esto como el que quiere estar muy, muy a la moda o tienes que darle más redención de puntos, ¿cómo funciona? Gracias. Ok. Um, so, the whole thing with the player is, they come in and they want something very specific. They want points, they want prizes, they want badges. Um, now, when you create your system, you'll have several phases. And the first phase is the onboarding phase, when they come into it. And at that point, players are very useful, because they come in and they, they're very excited by all of the stuff they can collect. What you're trying to do with the user types is you're trying to go from that extrinsic motivator, like we heard about earlier, and make something intrinsic. So you're trying to find what's going to turn them on, what they're going to enjoy. So if they come in as a player, and you've got, again, I'll go to Cora, because it's, an, it's a nice example. If they go in and they're looking for points and badges, but you can convince them with your system that actually answering questions is more useful to them and they actually enjoy that, and you, you, they, they get this sort of learning curve where they start answering questions and getting some rewards, but eventually you, you take them off the rewards and it's just they like being there because they like answering questions, then that's how you keep them. If all you're doing is keeping the badges and the points, you've got to keep adding content all the time. And that's how World of Warcraft, you know, they, they keep adding content, but actually it's a big social network. The reason it's still going 10 years later is not because they keep adding content, it's because there's a social network. But originally when everyone came in, they went in to kill people and to collect things. So there are still people playing Richard Bartle's game, MUD. I mean, this, that, was invent, that was in the 80s or the, 70, you know, the, the early 80s. There are still people there, they just use it as a social network. So you've got to find the intrinsic reason to keep them there once the points and badges have faded away. Había otra pregunta por aquí? Andre. Thank you for Spanish. Yeah. Thank you for your amazing talk. Uh, I have one question. When designing a gamified system, uh, when do you recommend to use the player tabs? At what moment of the process? Um, Personally, I'd say right at the start. Now, a lot of the stuff we've heard about is about product. 
It's about the end product, and then you kind of work backwards from there. Um, I'm talking about designing for people, not for product. So personally, I would look at a system and I'd say, right, I, need, I, I want this to happen. So I know what my end goal is. Um, how do I get there? Well, I'm going to look at what the people I've got around me are. And who's going to be interested in this final bit? And how can I get them to go into the system initially? So I'm going to look at, um, do I want players? Do I actually want to start a system which is just about socializers? I'm going to start thinking about the people at the design, the initial design phase. Because if you try and sort of reverse engineer it, the system wasn't built for people, it was built for the product. So you're never going to get back to the point where the people are always going to start off engaged. Hi, I have a, a tricky question. Thank you oh, for good, your good, presentation. Good. I'm working in the health domain. And in that case, I would like to know technique to kick out people from the game. Let me explain. To kick For, people out? Yeah. Imagine okay. in vaccination, that is very important in public health, there are a lot of people anti-vaccination. So you don't want those people to destroy the game by promoting people not to vaccine. Or okay. similar case, it can be people promoting anorexia. Yeah. So you want to know a way of kind of, of, of health checking the system and getting rid of people who might try and disrupt it? Yeah. Okay. Um, good question. <laughs> There are two ways that I've, that I've personally seen in action or used myself. The first way is you, you build a system that doesn't allow them, which is, which is easy to say in kind of a social network environment where you just press a button and they're out of the system. Um, the other way is you have, you have people who caretake the system. So you look at philanthropists. You look for people who want to look after the overall system and pick these people out. But it, it, it's, you can't automatically do it. You've got to... You have to have people you can trust to look after the system. Um, we were talking about Iversity earlier and uh, Coursera, where they have ambassadors of the system. And uh, Once you've gone through the course and you've been promoted up to ambassador, then you can, you can maintain the forums, you can help people, you can kick people out. That's what you need. You need to build a network of people who's, who are invested in making the system good and therefore can control the ones who want to destroy it. Just one small comment. Mm -hmm. In those cases, actually, the bad people, they are far more engaged than the good people. Um, uh, okay, I think, have I got time for a very small example? Yep. Right, so on my blog, I've written about this actually, on my blog I had one particular user who wanted to get all the points he could, all the badges he could, everything he could do, and hit the top of my leaderboard, okay? Now, I'll explain, yes, I use points and badges on my website, I use it because my users found it fun. That's the only reason. I wasn't trying to engage people with it. It was just a bit of fun. And I'm a gamified system. I'm a gamification writer. I've got to have something. You know, it's kind of... So anyway, he decided to break the system. He wanted to find every loophole there was. And he did. And he hit the top of the system. Um, and he scared off everyone else. Because I mean, he, had, he had three times the score of everyone else. But he wasn't engaged. He was engaged in breaking the system. He didn't know anything about what I'd written. So he wasn't engaged with my content, he was engaged with breaking the system, so he was no use to me. So I actually asked the developers of the system to be able to either reduce his points or kick him. Because whilst the ones who are trying to damage it may be engaged, they're no use to you. They don't actually help you unless they find things you can develop afterwards. So that the other trick is, if, you, if they're finding things that break your system, fix it and get them to help you fix it if they want to. If they don't want to, you've just got to ban them. You can't, if your system's to help people and they're disrupting the help, then they're not of value to you or the system. Bueno, nos hemos quedado ya sin tiempo. We have no more time. That's but fine. thank you very much. Un fuerte aplauso para Andrew. Thank you. Thank you.